Hi, I'm Rick Barron, and last week on RAF5, we talked about the recent results of the thymectomy study from Icena Gravis, which were long awaited and I interpreted and many others as being a positive study showing that thymectomy is an effective treatment for Myasthenia Gravis. I've invited my partner at K in KU Neurology, Dr. Gary Gronseth, to give his view of the results of that trial. Gary? Thanks very much, uh, Rick. Uh, Rick originally wanted me to take the no side, but that's not how I roll. I'll just tell you what I think based on the quality, quality of the study. So obviously this is the study, so let's peer behind the curtain and see what actually was done. So of course they recruited patients with a generalized myasthenia gravis and they randomized them to get thymectomy plus prednisone or no thymectomy plus prednisone and then they followed them over three years looking at various outcomes, one of the primary outcomes being the QMG, uh, although that was tested multiple times throughout the trial. So in terms of figuring out the validity of the trial, this is our checklist. So on the left are design and execution criteria that are important, and on the right are the sources of bias that those design and execution uh, criteria um, actually address, mitigate. So right off the bat, because it's a randomized controlled trial, we deal with a lot of potential sources of bias, but we've got two things to consider so uh, um, that uh, you know, aren't obviously addressed just from the design of the trial. So first, study retention, how many patients were lost to follow-up and crossed over. So uh, this is a flow diagram that's taken from the appendix of the article. Uh, they randomized 126 patients. They did have some patients cross over, either from thymectomy that didn't get it or that were uh, supposed to get medical therapy alone and got thymectomy. But they analyzed this appropriately using an intent to treat analysis. And then they did have patients patients lost the follow-up, but this was 12%, which is less than the 20%, which is a, a usual heuristic where we start to worry about the validity of the trial. So relative to retention, uh, did well, so check there. The next thing is blinding. So the study uh, did have blinded uh, outcome assessors, um, so they get a check for measurement bias or a, a observer expectation bias. The outcome assessors didn't know who was on what treatment, but the patients knew what they were on, and so there's a potential placebo effect, and the treating doctors knew what they were uh, taking, and so uh, they may have treated the patients otherwise differently. So let's look at those potential sources of bias. So the placebo effect, this is the QMG scores from the study that shows uh, how the patients did. The placebo effect is not an enduring effect. It generally decays with time. And so if there were an important placebo effect affecting the results, I would have expected these lines to move together. In the absence of that, I don't think that there was a huge placebo effect, particularly toward the end of the study. It was a three-year study. What about performance bias? Well, if you think of collateral treatments for uh, myasthenia gravis, like uh, steroid sparing agents, plasma exchange, and IVIG. And it turns out that for the most part, if you got thymectomy, you had less collateral treatment. Plasma exchange was about the same. My suspicion is that uh, more patients got plasma exchange early in the thymectomy group in preparation for the thymectomy. Uh, and then uh, the patients on prednisone alone uh, got, got it later. But don't know that for sure, but regardless, the patients on uh, prednisone alone were getting more collateral therapies than the patients on thymectomy, uh, and so I don't think there was performance bias. And so check, check, this study looks good. This is a very valid study. It has a very low risk of bias. It meets AAN criteria for class one. So now we look at the effect size. What did it show? What did the study show? Well, people like to look at the p-value, and this difference in the QMG score is uh, statistically significant, but is this difference really important? And this is where I originally struggled with the results of the study. The, the sort of the total average uh, of the difference is 2.85. 2.3 is something that in the study was described as being clinically detectable. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you know, uh, the same thing as important. But uh, if you look at the difference between these two, and then account for the fact that there was a one point difference at the beginning, the, 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 the change uh, is less than that 
three. It's about 2.1. So is that important? It's really hard to tell whether that's clinically meaningful. And when we're stuck with something like that, it's always best to look at an, a binary outcome, a yes, no sort of an outcome. And indeed, they measured an important outcome. This wasn't one of the um, primary outcomes of the study, but uh, we can use it from an EBM perspective to determine the clinical significance. So they looked at patients with minimal manifestation uh, status, the percentage that attain that, and to make these the, the graphs uh, kind of parallel, this is the percentage without uh, 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 that didn't attain minimal manifestation status, sort of like remission, either on drug or off drug. And so the prednisone alone group and the thymectomy plus a prednisone group illustrated there. And the risk difference at the end of the study is 20%. So 20% more patients with thymectomy may got to minimal manifestation status. That is a relatively large effect, easy to interpret. The number needed to treat is five. Um, for every five patients treated with thymectomy, one additional patient got to minimal manifestation status that otherwise wouldn't. That's a big effect. That's an important effect. Much easier to interpret that than the QMG. So how do we put all this together? This is our standard synthesis tool that we use in the AAN EBM world where we enter all this information, the class of the study. Um, we judge that the generalizability of these patients of the study is good, that there's only minor indirectness issues. We judge that not based on the result. We don't sort of look at the result, not like it, and then there, therefore say that it's not generalizable. People do that. You know who you are. Um, but then, and here's the effect. Now, notice that the 95% confidence intervals extend down to 1.6%. It's possible that the number needed to treat is just 60, is uh, as large as 67. And so based on the fact that it's a single class one study and the, those wide confidence intervals, uh, we conclude, we will conclude that it's probably effective. Now, this isn't, this isn't AAN uh, dogma yet, but uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, likely where we'll end up. So here's the conclusion. For patients with generalized myosin agravis, thymectomy plus prednisone is probably more effective than prednisone alone in increasing the chance of attaining minimal manifestation status. That's the critical appraisal. Well, thank you, Dr. Grossetz, for being my friend and for weighing in on RAF5 this week and for giving us your synthesis of that really important neuromuscular study. Thanks again.